My name is Alexander King. I'm uh, currently a director at large of the Old Spanish National uh, Old Spanish Trail Association. Um, the Old Spanish Trail uh, is a trail that uh, was recognized as a national historic trail by Congress in 2002. Uh, and it's recognized for the commercial pack trains that went between Santa Fe, New Mexico, who is way over here, and Los Angeles, which is way over here. Now, the story behind this particular trail is that it was, of course, originally Native American trails. And a large portion of it, especially the portions in California and Nevada and western Utah, are the same as the shell trade routes. The Spanish, in their colonial efforts in northern Mexico and all of the southwest was, of course, originally Spain and then Mexico, they were trying uh, to link their furthest most, northernmost colonies, Alta California and Nuevo Mexico, but they didn't, didn't get around to actually making that happen. They didn't really have the resources or the impetus. But when Mexico got their independence from Spain, they definitely had their uh, reasons for doing so. And most of it was because of commerce and trade. There had been expeditions in the 18th century trying to get from Santa Fe to California, various ones, uh, Gar Father Garces, Dominguez and Escalante. But most of those never established a particularly reliable or safe route and part of that's because, of course, this is one of the most arid regions in North America. In 1829, Antonio Armijo, who was a trader from Jemez, New Mexico, and a military man, uh, took up the challenge and he successfully uh, found a way with an expedition of pack mules loaded with woolen goods from Santa Fe to Los Angeles. It took him about Oh, I think it was about four months. Uh, he arrives in January of 1830 and then returns. And because he could do it, he successfully navigated the desert and the watering holes, the trade began. Um, the southern route that you see on this map is the Armijo route. He went uh, essentially just north of the Grand Canyon. But later traders didn't use that route, and part of the reason for that was, well, one is there's a big hole in the ground, the Grand Canyon, and the other reason is that the Navajo and the Hopi and other Native Americans there did not want them crossing their territory. And the water holes were unreliable. Now, as you might imagine, getting from one place to another re requires that you have adequate water, um, and the route ended up becoming a large 2,700 mile arch from Santa Fe up through southern Colorado to the central Utah and then south southwest through Nevada and California mainly to get safely from water hole to water hole uh, through what was mostly and to this day is Native American territory. Now, after Antonio Armijo, there were several, many people who came, uh, William Wolfskill, uh, George Yount. Uh, there were routine trade parties with Santiago Martinez and Lorenzo Trujillo and Hippolito Espinosa. Uh, so much so that every man, woman, and child would have had a blanket from New Mexico by maybe 1833. The trade continued. Uh, we, the Californians did not need the blankets. They clearly were ending up on ships and probably going somewhere in the Pacific. But the New Mexicans wanted the horses and the mules because that was extremely valuable. They would drive them back to Santa Fe and sell them to the Americans over the Santa Fe Trail to Missouri. That became such an effort and such a lucrative effort uh, that frankly illegal trade began and the Old Spanish Trail is as much about the illegal trade as it is about the legal trade. 
uh, and its consequences, which are significant to American history. Our interest has basically been in California, and that's my specialty. Um, this is the old Spanish trail uh, in a detail. Uh, you're seeing it from the Utah-Nevada state line, coming through Las Vegas, crossing over through Tacopa towards Death Valley, doesn't quite reach there, but then drops down past Baker, uh, through Fort Irwin and Barstow, through the western Mojave Desert, around the Mojave River, in fact, the same route that Route 66 later took, and then it crosses into Southern California through Cajon Pass and the San Bernardino Mountains. From Victorville and Oro Grande, there were multiple routes that they did take depending on when and depending on which group. They all converged either through Cajon Pass or they converged here at, at the bottom near uh, Glen Helen. But then there were two possible routes to take. One, a direct route into Los Angeles, which actually went uh, past Red Hill and Cucamonga through what's now Pomona, down through the San Jose Valley, which is the Pomona Walnut Valley, and then up to Mission San Gabriel and ultimately into the plaza at Los Angeles. An alternate route would have been a mission road that was east north of the Puente Hills and a road to the San Bernardino Estancia, uh, which goes north of the Harupa Hills. Now, except for this stretch here, which was trail, the rest of this route were mission era ox cart roads. This area here became the western terminus, or you might say the organizing, the, where the, par the caravans were assembled and organized. Um, the trade was furious and uh, very lucrative, as I said, gathering lots of horses and mules uh, and keeping them in one area before you were ready to drive east on this trail required that you kept them in an area. Well, this is before you could have, you could corral. There were no fencing. So they aggregated themselves around Politana. Now that's sometimes now known as Bunker Hill. And that's right on the city line between Colton and San Bernardino. And that was used because it was a natural redoubt from the top of this hill. Not only can you see in 360 degrees, you can see Cajon Pass, you can see San Timoteo Canyon, you can see people coming up from Temecula, you can see people along the Mission Road towards Pomona, but it is surrounded by natural hot springs and it's perpetually watered and green at the base of the hill and nothing else is. It's the rest of the countryside is desert. The livestock naturally stayed surrounding the wetlands there. Um, in fact, La Politana, contrary to some earlier histories, we believe is named after Hippolito Espinosa, Hippolito's place. By around 1839 and 1840, uh, the missions were being secularized, which meant, means that they were uh, being broken apart by the Mexican government. The lands were being sold as ranches to various people, and uh, one of the Lugos was acquiring the land out here in what became San, the city of San Bernardino, and that included the Politana site. He was having to defend his livestock from being stolen by Native Americans in the area. Uh, and part of the reason was this interface is uh, this area is an interface between, uh, and had for a millennia has been an interface between the Cahuillas, the Serranos the Kish, Tongva, Gabrieleno groups. Um, and because it was uh, an, a, a no man's land, or at least a disputed area, uh, they felt free to raid whatever was on the edges. Being frustrated with this, uh, Lugo approaches Santiago Martinez about 1840 and makes a deal with him, saying if you can bring 
bring as many people as you want, bring your families if you want, you can stay on this hill. In return, you guard my livestock. They took them up on this, and there's a couple of reasons for this. One of them is the fact is economics, and the other reason is political history of northern Mexico in that era. Uh, but they left New Mexico and they came here and Lugo reneges on the deal. <laughs> so they're looking for, where else do we go? Uh, Santiago Martinez approaches the Ayuntamiento and the entire area, the only government was in Los Angeles. And he actually wants to go to Habanera, which is actually the confluence of the Rio Hondo and the Los Angeles River, which is where Downey is today. Uh, but the Ayuntamiento doesn't agree, and not everybody in the New Mexican group agrees. Uh, Lorenzo Trujillo, on the other hand, strikes up a deal with Juan Bandini. Juan Bandini owns Rancho Jurupa, and the northeastern point of Rancho Jurupa, which is actually at Slover Mountain, uh, was this watered valley of the Santa Ana River, uh, where it actually takes a bend south and flows now directly down south to Riverside. Uh, it was right in the middle of that no man's land. So the New Mexicans actually take him up on this offer. Uh, and in 1845, Lorenzo Trujillo and the people that had been ejected from Politana uh, begin the settlement first on the east side of the river, which is La Placita, La Placita de los Trujillos, the Trujillo Plaza or Trujillo's place. Uh, that same year, additional colonists are coming to California because the Mexican government in California, the frontier has been depopulated. Now, part of the reason it's been depopulated is they secularized the missions. Another part of the reason it's been depopulated is there's a Ute chief by the name of Wakara. And he has coordinated some of the most thorough raids on the California missions and their livestock. In 1840, he and his band of associates, sometimes called the Chaguanosos, uh, and that includes not just Native Americans, uh, Jean-Pierre Chalafou is one of them, uh, Peg Lake Smith is rumored to be one of them, but they sweep through the Mo northern Mojave, through Tejon and Tehachapi, across the southern San Joaquin, and wipe out the cattle and horses and mules from Mission San Miguel and San Luis Obispo, most of the inland herd of Santa Barbara, and they sweep all the way down into San Luis Rey and Capistrano. The state and the Mexican authorities need to repopulate these areas and they essentially I think in terms of real estate begins then uh, they're soliciting people from all over anywhere over the Pacific Americans and people coming from New Mexico who come over the old Spanish Trail uh, one of those parties comes to Aguamanza in 1845 others go up to San Luis Obispo others go up even further north to Vacaville and Fairfield in uh, Northern California the community here on the banks of the Santa Ana River uh, thrives, but it's very unique and it's actually unique in California history in that it's the only land in California that has communal water rights. And that dates back to their original grant and the fact that they actually were recognized as the first, one of the first towns in California in 1852. 